All right, let's do it. Welcome back. Last week we finished with verse 13. So we're ready to take up John 1, 14. A verse of some depth and importance. Uh, but before we do, let's open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You and rejoice that You have sent Your Son, the Eternal Word, uh, to take on human flesh, to be born of the Blessed Virgin, to dwell among us, and especially uh, to stand as our, sac as our substitute in atoning for our sin, by, by whose death, and, and only by whose death, could we have peace with You. Open to us the Scripture that we may understand this mystery that You reveal only by Your Spirit. Send your spirit then that we may know this mystery and believe and in such faith receive eternal life according to your promise. In the name of Jesus, your Son, the eternal word. Amen. Okay, John 1, 14. The verse is... The verse is... And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory... Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're going we're gonna to pause here for a bit and, and reflect on this verse. Because there's a lot going on. Remember that in the preceding th the 13 verses, John has been explaining that the eternal Word uh, was with God. The eternal word has come into the world, that, um, that John was a witness to the word. In the word was life, and that life was the light of men. And now we're told the word, uh, and who is the word? Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. So, this is a good thematic verse for, for this gospel account because it teaches us that the events of the life and death of Jesus, thank you, <laughs> that the life and, and, and the death of Jesus are to be interpreted theologically which is to say that these things did happen. They happened exactly as recorded. There is no error in the Bible. It is in its entirety inspired by God. But that there is theological meaning to the events and the words themselves. Right? So, first of all, what we're discussing is called the Incarnation. The Incarnation is, first of all, a mystery. Now understand, when we Western Christians say mystery, we do not mean um, either that it's like this Scooby-Doo kind of thing where you have to investigate and figure it out, but neither do we mean it like the Eastern Christians mean, where it's this unsearchable, unknowable kind of out there in the ether, sort of. The word mystery simply means we wouldn't know it unless God told us. The Trinity is a mystery. Which is to say, we, we could not have arrived at the Trinity except that God had revealed it to us. Right? Natural knowledge of God does not get you here. Natural knowledge of God is I go out into nature and I realize that God really loves order. God really loves beauty. Although that beautiful creation is constantly trying to kill me, right? I go out to hike to the waterfall and in the way the sun tries to burn my pasty skin, the rocks try to break my ankles, the bear tries to eat my backpack, all that good stuff, right? Um, so <laughs> natural knowledge of God only gets you to there's a God, he's really powerful. 
Doesn't even tell you if he knows who you are or if he loves you. That requires revelation. That requires God to reveal himself to you. The incarnation, then, is a mystery in that sense that you would only know this because God has revealed it. Now, how is it that God reveals himself in the... Well, when you say word... The incarnation is this, that when you look at the man Jesus, you are seeing God. So, this requires us Christians to make certain confessions regarding Jesus. For example, when it comes to St. Mary, we call her the what? The mother of God. St. Mary is the mother of God, and Lutherans must refer to her this way. Why? Not because God receives his being from Mary. No. God is eternal. He's dependent on no one for existence. It is, however, a confession of who the baby in Mary's womb is. And we sing it in that hymn, don't we? In her womb this truth was shown. God was there upon his throne, right? That the baby in the womb of the Blessed Virgin is, in fact, God. And so we call Mary the mother of God because there were those who tried to say, well, she's only the mother of his human nature. We have to rebuke, we, we, we have to, to rebuke this and refute it. But we're going to get to Nestorianism a little bit later. Um, so... Philip, for example, the, the apostle. Philip asks Jesus what question? Show us the Father, right? And what does Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? What is the Father like? Look to Jesus. What does the Father want with me? Look at Jesus. Does God the Father love me? Your answer is in Jesus, right? This is the mystery of the incarnation. That the eternal Son of God, the, the eternal Word, takes on human flesh, right? Um, going through a couple of the words in the verse, when we say flesh... There's kind, of a, there's kind of a dual meaning to the word flesh. On the one hand, it means a physical body. That now, because of the incarnation, we can say that God has hands. God has skin. God has fingernails which have gotten dirty. Right? God has been tired. God has suffered. God has died. All this is because the second person of the Trinity united himself to a human nature, right? He took on humanity into himself. However, it also means that God has lived among us, right? God has had a fleshly existence. We talk about this sometimes when we talk about prayer or when you read the book of Hebrews, right? When you pray to God and you say, God... I'm really lonely, and I'm poor, and people lie about me. Has God ever been there? As a matter of fact, in the man Christ Jesus, yes, he has. Now, the man Jesus never sinned, so... <laughs> um, it's... it's it's not, well, you know, I'm suffering the consequences of my sin, God, you've been there. No, he hasn't been there. But he has suffered the consequences of your sin, namely, being forsaken by the Father and, and crucified, right? There's a verb here, and in English it gets translated as dwelled or dwelt. The 
there are a couple of, of ways that you can translate this. Uh, this is the verb you would use for pitching a tent. It's kind of an odd turn of phrase, isn't it? Well, are there tents in the Bible? I mean, I guess, I guess Paul was a tent maker. Yes, the tabernacle, right? You could just as easily translate this verb tabernacled, except that I really hate when people do that in English and they make new verbs out of nouns, but whatever. We're, we're going to do it anyway because the Bible actually does that sometimes. Um, <laughs> make disciples of all nations. Make disciples is actually just the noun for disciple turned into a verb, like disciple the nations, whatever. So you could easily say, rightly, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Well, how much baggage is laden on that word then? T yeah, tabernacle. How important was that in the Old Testament? It's really hard to overstate the importance because what is the tabernacle? <laughs> One, you, you, can, you can safely worship God without him killing you. Not unimportant. <laughs> What else? It's where God dwells with His people, right? God dwells with His people between the cherubim on the mercy seat for the purpose of dispensing His mercy, right? When God dwells among His people, He does so for the purpose of being merciful and giving them mercy, right? So He comes not, um, He comes not in terror. He comes not in judgment. He comes in mercy. Now, sin or worship falsely, there will be judgment. But he comes chiefly for the purpose of mercy, right? And so the tabernacle is the place where God dwells with his people. He leads them, right? He's in the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of uh, fire by night. He leads his people, Israel. When they get to the Red Sea, where does the pillar go? He stands between Israel and, and Pharaoh's army, so he defends them with his presence. And when the people gather around him in his presence, they are there gathered with him. There he is in the midst of them, as we might say in, in, in the Matthew 28 terms. When God's people gather around him, he, he's there to be merciful, right? He's not far from them. He's very near to them. So, in the New Testament, Jesus is the tabernacle, and to put it even a little bit better, Jesus is the temple, right? And we're going to find this out in John. Jesus is going to talk about the temple, and he's going to tell the Jews, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rebuild it. And they're thinking, it took David, it took Solomon, it took thousands of slaves and lots of years to build this thing up. Well, John tells us he was talking about his body. Now, here's the odd thing. For us, for us human beings, which is easier? To rebuild the Temple of Solomon in three days or to take a body that is dead and bring it to life in three days? <laughs> right. It sounds like, oh, well, he just, he just meant that he's going to live again. You know, you can line up a bunch of bulldozers and, and, uh, and, and workers and you could make a good stab at rebuilding a building in three days. But no amount of money is going to take a dead body and make it, make it live again. No amount of technology, no amount of money, no amount of skill is going to do that. That's precisely what Jesus did. He died on the third day. His temple, the place where God dwells with man for the purpose of dispensing um, sin, or dis dispensing grace by the forgiveness of sins, is destroyed and rebuilt in three days. Now, what else happens in a temple? People go to pray, they go to worship. Sacrifices are made in the temple, right? The altar of the temple is going to be very, uh, well, sturdy. It's going to have to hold a lot of weight. You put, in many cases, entire animals on there. It's going to be like a, a grill. So you've got coals that are going so that you can burn the sacrifices. You've got 
other altars that hold coals in reserve. You've got incense over here. You have sluices built on the side so that the blood can drain away from it. And the sacrifices are constantly ongoing. Why couldn't they just sacrifice once and be done with it? Excellent. Yeah, because that one sacrifice, the one sacrifice that could be done once and you're done with it is Christ. That's a, that's a huge point in the book of Hebrews, right? The sacrifices in the temple had to keep going because those sacrifices didn't forgive sin. This is why we don't try to rebuild the temple. This is why in New Testament Christianity under the New Covenant, we don't make sacrifice. Even in the Lord's Supper, we are not making any sacrifice. Rather, Christ takes his body, which he sacrificed himself, and presents it to us. Okay. Glory. Here's a good Old Testament word. In the Old Testament, when do we hear about God's glory? Sure. Right, yeah, his, his glory is present from creation. Do you remember when Moses comes down from the mountain and the people couldn't even look at Moses? Why not? His face was shining so bright they couldn't behold it. Now, does Moses have glory of his own? No. His is reflected glory, right? It's like looking at the moon. The moon doesn't have its own light. It merely reflects the light of the sun, right? So if, if the people couldn't look at the reflected glory of God in the face of Moses, a fellow sinner, how much greater is God's glory? All the Old Testament saints knew, if you behold God's glory and you're a sinner, you are dead, dead, dead. Ask Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he recounts the vision of the Lord in the heavenly throne room, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, I had, you know, I saw the Lord. He's there in the throne room, right? And there are the cherubim, and the cherubim are calling out, "Holy, holy, holy!" Why three holies? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, the, the the church had not invented the Trinity yet. It's almost like it always was there. Um, three, yeah, not holy, but three times holy is the Lord, right? His glory is filling is filling the temple. And what does Isaiah say? Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right? The, the Hebrew there, oi li, is, is, is in modern Hebrew, oi ve. I'm toast. I'm dead. I'm a, sinners can't stand before God and live. They got that, and they're entirely right. So... What does the Lord do? He tells the angel, take the coal from the, from the altar, touch it to his lips. And he says, behold, this has touched your lips. Your sin is atoned for. Your guilt is taken away. You can only stand before a holy God as a sinner by having your sin atoned for. And this is written 800 years before Jesus is even born. Yes. Yeah, there, there's no lights in the heavenly city because Christ himself is the light. Right. And the people live there eternally, and they don't die because their sin's been washed, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah, there was light before the creation of the sun and the stars. Yeah. So, what is, what is John saying about glory? Well, he says, we have seen his glory. Who's we, John? Well, in a sense, anyone who's seen Jesus. The Mount of Transfiguration. One of the things that we noted that was different about John's gospel account is that there's not an accounting of the Transfiguration. Now listen. If you or I 
were taken up privately by Jesus. We're just, it's a, it's a party of three and Jesus and Moses and Elijah and the Father and the Holy Spirit. But no more than that. And then you're up there on the mountain and Jesus is praying. And as he's praying, the Father's voice comes thundering from heaven. This is my beloved son. But before that happens, Moses and Elijah show up. The law, the greatest of the prophets. And they're talking. And Luke tells us what they're talking about. The Greek word for what they're talking about is what? Exodus. His departure, right? They're talking about his upcoming death, right? And so Moses and Elijah are there. By the way, I bring this up anytime I, I mention the, the transfiguration. No one had to be introduced. Peter, James, John, this is Moses. You, you know Moses, right? Peter, James, John, this is Elijah, the greatest of the prophets. They knew who they were. You don't lose your identity after you die. You are who you are, but without sin, which is to say you're not less than you were before. You are more yourself than you, in fact, have ever been. Some Christians get kind of afraid that they're going to lose their identity. No, that's not heaven. Um, but anyway, after Peter and, and, and James and John, they see this. Peter, of course, does the typical Peter. Oh, Peter. And he, let's keep this thing going. Let's build tabernacles, right? Let's build dwelling places, tents, where, you, where we can keep this thing going. You can, you know, one for each of the three of you. And the father calls out, this is my beloved son. And then he says, listen to him. And the three are thrown onto the ground. And when they look up, they see no one but Jesus alone. Right? Now, if you or I saw that, it, it would probably be the highlight of any of our writing. However, did any of those three write any portions of the New Testament? All three did. John doesn't, John doesn't put the account in his gospel or in any of his three epistles. Peter does. Peter puts it in his epistle, but what does he say? Yeah, we beheld his glory, but you people have something even more certain than that. The Word. Which is to say, if you have the Word of God, you have something even more certain than the revelation that they received on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, to me, that is astounding. Because we think, I mean, even when we know better, we think, man, if, if I had just seen what they saw, my faith would be so strong. And they say, no, nah, if you have the Word of God, you have something better and more sure than what we saw. And what they saw was great. I mean, they heard the voice of the Father. But then again, when you have the Word of God, you hear the voice of the Father. Same voice, same Father. And that's, that's kind of the point, is that you want to go where God is, you want to have an encounter with God, go to the Word. And James, he likely dies before he has a, a chance to write about it, uh, but it's not in his epistle. So anyway, we beheld his glory. Um, Jesus' glory is most fully revealed in John's gospel, ultimately in his passion and death. Jesus says that I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men to myself, right? It's, it's true elsewhere in Scripture, but it's very true in John's Gospel that Jesus' glorification is spoken of mostly to do with his crucifixion. Does that seem odd to us? Kind of. I mean, we, I think we Christians understand why. But... When we think of glorification, we think of Easter morning, maybe the ascension, maybe the transfiguration. I mean, you've, you've gone through the liturgical cycle with us. You've, you've been in church on Good Friday. Does it feel like a victory? It doesn't feel like it, but what? But it is, right? That's, that, that event is the only way 
that you can stand before the glory of God and not die. No, the, the glory of the Father and the glory of the Son are one. Lastly, let's turn to Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him, that would be Moses, and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So, first of all, you have, you have the, the glory of the Lord. But you also have the Lord referred to as a God merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Um, there's some, I wanted to say there were some manuscripts where this was more like grace and truth. But if you look at, uh, go back to John 1.17 for a second. I know that's reading a little bit ahead. But if you look at John 1.17, John says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here Jesus is contrasted with Moses. right? Through Moses came the law, through Jesus Christ comes grace and truth. And then back in 14, where we're, what we're studying this morning, John says, we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, are grace and truth opposed to one another? No. But that's kind of a temptation for the modern church, isn't it? Well, how, how are grace and truth set opposed to one another? Well, what's grace? Undeserved, undeserved love, undeserved favor, right? What's truth? Yeah, describing things as they are. Well, in the modern church, and by no means is this unique to the modern church. There have, there have been this impulse for a long time that too much emphasis on the church could be perceived as unloving. And so, well, um, you know, and, and, and so, the, so Christians who would set God's truth aside will emphasize God's grace, saying, well, you know, God's grace is bigger than, right? Now, we know grace and truth go hand in hand. They're both attributes of God. As a matter of fact, if you want to see grace and truth, you look to Jesus. Um, one last thing on the verse itself before we get into a 25-minute whirlwind trip through Christology is, uh, yeah, that's good fun because it took us a whole semester to get through it, but we're doing it in 25 minutes. Um, <laughs> John calls Jesus the only begotten Son. Now, there are a couple of different ways of saying only. This version of only, it doesn't, it doesn't merely mean that he's the only begotten Son. It means he's kind of one of a kind. There are no other sons like this. That's kind of a great refutation of of those who would try to say that we become like Jesus in our sonship. For example, the Mormons, right? Now, do we become sons of God? Yes. How? By adoption. Exactly. Yes. Right. We are not, we're not begotten of the Father ontologically. We're not eternally begotten of the Father. Rather, we are adopted as sons by grace. Now, as adopted sons by grace, does that mean we stand to share in the inheritance? Yes. That, in, in fact, that's the whole point. Is so that we may share in the Father's inheritance. And here's the cool thing about math. In, in a fraction, if the numerator is infinity, 
You can raise the denominator as high as you want. It doesn't lower the share that each part gets, right? <laughs> so when, when more souls are added to God's kingdom, does that diminish our inheritance? No, math doesn't work that way. Neither does God. <laughs> he's, he's infinite, right? His riches are infinite. He's God. But that's also true of his love, right? It's not that we receive exactly one, you know, what, three billionth or what, you know, however many you want to you put in there of, of his love. His love is infinite, right? The more that are added, we each share in, in his love fully. So, um, he's, the, he's the only begotten, he's the only one like this, which is to say that only Jesus is the Son. No one else may claim to be the Son of God, except in, in the way that we're going to talk about, especially in chapter 3, where you become you know, born of God through water and the Spirit. In the handout, we're going to look very briefly we're not going to read all of this, but I do commend all of it to you. Some of these are uh, confessional documents, namely the Athanasian Creed and the Formula of Concord. Those are required to be confessed by all Lutheran pastors as, as true. Um, we have Luther's commentary. Uh, we're, we don't necessarily have to endorse everything Luther ever said, but most of it's pretty good. Um, so uh, we have the just excerpts from Luther's commentary on... John 1.14 here. It, I've always found it particularly good. And then lastly, we have some excerpts from Francis Pieper, kind of the chief dogmatician uh, or systematic theologian of the Missouri Synod, uh, would have been uh, active in ministry right around the turn of the 20th century. In the Athanasian Creed, and I just have an excerpt for it here on page one, we say that it is necessary for everlasting salvation, the Catholic faith is this, one must affirm two mysteries. They are the Trinity and the Incarnation. You must confess that God is triune, that God is one, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You must confess that God became man. which, if you know much about Christian theology, it's not a terribly high bar, but it's not supposed to be. It's, it, this, is, this is the bare minimum. Like, if, if you can't affirm this, there's simply no way that you can call yourself Christian. If you deny the Trinity, there's, there's no sense of the word Christian in which it applies to you. Likewise, the Incarnation. Um, that also means that do we refer to those who affirm these two mysteries, do we affirm them as Christian? Yes. Right. So um, the Roman Catholic Church, do they affirm the Trinity and the Incarnation? Yes, they do. The Eastern Orthodox? Yes, they do. Baptists? Yes. Pentecostals? Some. Some do, some don't. Um, Right. Okay, uh, Luther's commentary on John 1:14. Uh, uh, it's it's in volume two of Luther or volume 22 of Luther's works. I commend all of it to you. It's wonderful. Uh, but if you look at the bottom of page one, Luther talks about the words and the word made flesh were always held with a special reverence because of everything we've been talking about. This is the mystery of the incarnation, that the word, the eternal word, was made flesh, right? And so uh, Luther says that, you know, these words were sung daily in every mass in a slow tempo and were set to a special melody. Now, when would these words be sung in a mass? in the Nicene Creed, right? In the Nicene Creed, we say, what?
You have to go through it in your head, right? Was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, right? If you listen to, to masses written by, and by no means are the Lutheran composers of masses the only ones that do this, but you can really hear it in, in a lot of Bach masses. Um, at, at the words, at homo factus est, he was made man. you'll often notice that it slows down dramatically to give the hearers time to ponder the mystery of the Incarnation, right? Turn the page a little bit. <clears throat> Bottom of page two. This is one of my favorite things that Luther ever wrote, just because it's, it's, it's hilarious to me. He says, the following tale is told about a coarse and brutal lout. What's a lout? Yeah. Just, yeah, kind of not that bright. While the words, and was made man, were being sung in church, he remained standing, neither genuflecting nor removing his hat. Uh, what's genuflecting? To bow the knee, right. Now, to be fair... Their rubric called for that. Ours doesn't specifically, no. Uh, but, but their rubric called, and their tradition was, they bowed the knee. That's not divinely commanded, but that's what, that's what they did. Sure. Well, I mean, we, we worship God with our posture, right? I mean, when the Father's voice is speaking from heaven on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John aren't just kneeling. They're prostrate. They're face down in the dust. They're brought as low as they can be, right? Uh, he showed no reverence, but just stood there like a clod. I love this writing. All the others dropped to their knees when the Nicene Creed was, crayed, uh, was prayed and chanted devoutly. Then the devil stepped up to him and hit him so hard it made his head spin. He cursed him gruesomely and said, May hell consume you, you boorish ass. If God had become an angel like me and the congregation saying God was made an angel... I would bend not only my knees, but my whole body to the ground. Yes, I would crawl 10 L's down into the ground. I don't know what an L is. Um, and you vile human creature, you stand there like a stick or a stone. You hear that God did not become an angel, but a man like you, and you just stand there like a stick of wood. We've talked about this a little bit in Genesis 1. We talked about this in several places when, when we discuss why does the devil hate humanity? And this gets at a lot of it. The, the point of the story, whether it happened or not, is actually not that important. The point of the story, granted, it is dramatically overtold. We're not even Luther at the time, nor do we think that if you don't kneel at the, at the words, you, you're cursing God. That's not the point. The point is they were supposed to, and he just stood there. I mean, he, he didn't do anything. He just, he didn't care was the point. And, and the devil, you know, comes up and says, do you have any idea what they're saying? The point of these words is that God became one of you to redeem you. The angels never had that. God never became an angel to redeem the fallen angels. But God became man to redeem fallen man. Which is why they would kneel and, and the words are spoken a little bit differently. I have... I've for years just, just you know, bowed at those words. Don't have to. Um, but the, the point is, those words should be afforded a certain amount of reverence because this is our salvation, that God became man for the purpose of being man's substitute under God's wrath. Yeah, I mean, this, but it's, it's entirely possible, in fact, it's probable that this didn't actually happen, you know. If you know Germans, they like to make stories up about, if you do this, bad things will happen to you. <laughs> yeah, God, yeah, God, you know, before Pharaoh, God considers Israel his firstborn. In other words, you're messing with me. Which is what Jesus says to, to Saul, right? When you persecuted Stephen, you persecuted me. 
yeah, so when, when, when the devil, when the world mess with God's saints, God takes it personally. Um, let's see. Uh, look at page four. Where it says, we have beheld his glory. Luther says, what does this mean? The evangelist wants to say that Christ not only demonstrated his humanity with his actions by dwelling among the people so that they could see him, hear him, speak with him, and live near him until his 34th year by suffering cold, hunger, and thirst in this feeble and wretched human form and nature, but that he also displayed his glory and power in proof of his divinity. Of this he gave proof with his teaching, his preaching, his signs and wonders, convincing anyone of his Godhead who was not blinded and hardened by the devil as the high priests and scribes were. By word and deed, he proved that he was God by nature. He healed the sick and raised the dead. In short, he wrought more and greater miracles than any prophet before him, in fact, than any other human being was able to do. By way of illustration, as God brought forth heaven and earth through the word, that is, e uh, through him, even so, he too performed all that he wished by uttering a word. For instance, little girl, I say to you, arise, and young man, I say to you, arise, and Lazarus come out, and to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go home, be delivered of your sickness, and to the lepers, be clean. Um, what Luther is talking about here is the personal union. Right? That that Christ is fully God and fully man. Now, there are a couple ways to get this wrong. This does not mean that there was a man walking around one day who became God. That's the plot of the novel Siddhartha. This is not like that. There, there, was, no, there was no man who just one day became God. Neither is it God just appearing to be a man. Rather, the Holy Spirit overshadows the Virgin Mary, and in her is the God-man Jesus Christ. He's fully God, he's fully man. And those two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, are united to one another eternally. So that when, when Christ returns to the Father, where does his human nature go? Where does his body go? With him, he, he's still a man. Now, that's really great news if you happen to be a human being. Because it means that one of your own is at the right hand of God. That means that, that your God is a man. He's one of you. Why is he one of you? For the purpose of saving you. It's why even at Christmas time, amongst all the joy, Gabriel has to tell Mary, a sword will pierce your own heart also. For this child is appointed for the rise and fall of many. I mean, as, as wonderful as Jesus' birth is, it must be remembered that this was always for the purpose of his death. It's that, that's the only way that we could have eternal life. So, um, fast forwarding a little bit. Go to page six. This is from the formula of Concord regarding the person of Christ. And this is the official teaching of the Lutheran Church. We believe, teach, and confess that the Son of God, although from eternity he has been a particular, distinct, entire divine person, and thus with the Father and the Holy Ghost, true, essential, perfect God, nevertheless in the fullness of time also has assumed human nature into the unity of his person, not in such a way that there are now two persons or two Christs, 
but that Christ Jesus is now in one person at the same time, true eternal God, born of the Father from eternity, and a true man, born of the most blessed Virgin Mary, as it is written in Romans 9, 5, of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who was over all God blessed forever. We believe, teach, and confess that now, in this one undivided person of Christ, there are two distinct natures, the divine which is from eternity, and the human which in time was assumed into the unity of the person of the Son of God, which two natures in the person of Christ are never separated from, nor mingled with one another, or changed the one into the other, but each abides in its nature and essence in the person of Christ to all eternity. We believe, teach, and confess also that as both natures mentioned remain unmingled and and undestroyed in their nature and essence, each retains also its natural essential properties and does not lay them aside to all eternity, neither do the essential properties of the one nature ever become the essential properties of the other nature. So, what does all that mean? It means that Christ has two natures, divine and human, How many Christs is that? One. One Christ, right? Now, does the person of Christ ever take attributes from one nature and lend them to another? Yes. Particularly, Christ's divine nature has the attribute of omnipresence right? God is present everywhere. How is it present that the body and blood of Christ are present everywhere? The communication of attributes, right? That 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 omnipresence is borrowed into humanity. Also, when Christ does any of his works, he does not do so only according to one nature, right? Right? It's a little bit easier when you hear how it gets confessed. So, for example, we talked about um, Christ being in the womb of his mother. Is is Christ's human nature alone in her womb? No, the entire Christ is. is. Who is in the womb of the Blessed Virgin? God, right? So, according to the Incarnation, can we ever say that God suffered? Yes, right? Who is it who was suffering? The God-man Jesus, right? So, on Good Friday, we say, oh, deep dread, our God's son is dead. Or God is dead. (laughs) Yeah, right. The one hymnal is the one, the one is the other. Can we say on Good Friday that God died? Yes. Who is on the cross? The God-man, Christ, who is both God and man. Sure, you do, right. Yeah. Yeah, and this, when you start thinking about things like that, it becomes very profound that God the Father forsakes God the Son for the sake of redeeming mankind. Right, exactly. All out of love for us. Not because he he was forced to, not because he had to, but simply out of a kind of love we can't begin to comprehend. Yeah, yeah, our our solution is we don't reconcile it. Where the Bible stops, we stop. Yeah, I'd have to look at the the Latin, how that got translated. Um, That's from the Triglotta. And as such, it's, it's about 100 years old as far as translations go. So I don't know if the usage changed over time. I probably would say begotten. <laughs> right. So, in, when we teach about the personal union, we see that God is divine, or we, we see that, that Christ is divine. Um, he, does, he does things that only God can do. He raises the dead. He heals the sick. He's risen from the dead. He does things only a man can do. He suffers. He gets tired. He dies, right? He he weeps. He bleeds. Um, But it also means that, that whatever Christ does, he does as both God and man, right? So those who spoke to Jesus were speaking to God. 
that means that if you want to see the Father, you look to the man Jesus, right? You know, they're, like there are some sons that are so much like their dad that if you just see the son, you, you've seen their dad. Jesus is that perfectly. It's not that there's any daylight between the father and the son according to their will. Because this is always the question, right? We want to see the father. We want to know the father. And Jesus says, if you have me, you have the father. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they killed him. <laughs> Right. Anything else on this? This is absolutely scratching the surface and not even that. Um, but it's a very important topic in theology, not only the incarnation, but also the, the study of Christ. Who is he? What does it mean that he's both God and man? And the thing of it is, when you listen to philosophers try to approach God from a philosophical standpoint, about first causes and first movers, and, and maybe there's value to it. Maybe I'm just too stupid to understand it, I guess. I don't know. But when you try to approach God apart from Christ, you end up studying God like he's just some impersonal, he's out there, and he's, he's something you maybe interact with or maybe you don't. But if you want to know what God's like, you look to Jesus. One of, the, one of the blessings of the Incarnation is that while it's difficult for us to comprehend God as God, it's fairly easy for us to comprehend the man Jesus. I mean, by comparison. Now, his teachings may sometimes be hard, and sometimes, you know, some, some of what he, he did and said we have to wrestle with, but the idea of a man who is born, who has parents, who lives under authority, who works, who has friends, who gets lied about, who's betrayed by his friends, who's poor, who, you know, he gets tired, he gets overwhelmed in crowds, uh, he, uh, he prays to God. He, um, he... This is actually fairly comprehensible to us because that's who we are. And... One of the nice things about the Incarnation is that's the revelation of God. You don't have to like try to peek through the curtain and see what, what's really behind all of this. Jesus is the revelation of the Father. All right, so the funny thing is, is we spent an hour on one verse. We could easily do more. But, but next, next week we'll take up verse 15. Yes. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll start with verse 15 next week. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.